All right. Well, good to be with you again. Um, they asked me if I would uh, share with you uh, my session on descendant research. And uh, many of us have been involved in doing descendant research. I still remember vividly my first experience trying to do descendant research. And I quickly realized that it wasn't just putting ascendancy research in reverse in, in doing the opposite. There were different record sets that were helpful. There were different strategies. Um, descendant research was very different than uh, ascendancy research. And so one of the things that I've done over the years is to try and capture some of that and to understand a little bit better how that's done. So I thought you would all enjoy uh, the descendancy chart uh, for the Star Wars trilogy. And the villains on the right, the good guys on the left, and the good guys on the right. And, uh, your tree may look similar. Okay, just check to see if you're awake. Um, one of the things that's very uh, important when you have as much ADD as I do, and that's trying to focus on your research. And for some reason, as we do research, it's easy to get distracted. Oh, we have that name in our family, Squirrel. Zoom, we're, we're over here. Oh, we have that one, and now we're over here. And so it's very hard to, to focus and to cover the bases and to make sure that we can close the book on that particular line. Because lo and behold, as soon as you see another line, it's over here, and all of a sudden, you're all over the map. I can see from heads nodding, I am not the only one that does that. So, we want to talk about some of the principles there, and then we want to look at some of the research sources and strategies, and then I will just wrap up. If you are doing ascendancy research, the total number in seven generations is 127 people. So, it's a defined set. Every person has two parents. We don't always know who they are, but every person has, as far as I know, two parents. Now, if you are doing the Senate research, the total number in seven generations is 10,922. Don't everybody pull and run from the room at this point. It is a staggering number. Think now about trying to deal with that type of population in your database. Many of you have very large databases on your desktop, and you have been managing these families for a lot of years. Um, now think about some of those families. Some of them have two children. Some of them have 17 children. Uh, you never know. And so we have to factor that in. So this is just a good estimate uh, based on about four children per generation of the total number in seven generations. Well, what's the historical picture of these descendants? Draw story event timelines. One of the things that happens is these people disappear and we never see them again. We don't know where they went. Many people were moving west. They were moving elsewhere in the globe. Um, I was searching uh, just emphatically for the marriage record for a half-sibling of mine. I could not find it because I, she was marriageable age. It would have changed her surname. I was trying to I was trying to locate her. I hadn't met her yet. Well, I you know. I'm employing all the research strategies that we can think about. You know, if they're not in this county, check these counties. You know, I knew I knew where the focus point was, but I could not find marriage for that for that half sister. I finally located her another way, and of course, one of the first things I asked her was, "Where were you married?" She laughed. She said, "Well, my husband was in the military in Germany, and so we were married in Germany." So. My radius search in the counties of Pennsylvania did not yield uh, very good results with my search strategy. Um, talk about the people and the people that interact with them. Look at the issues. Is there an issue that is driving them uh, somewhere? I just had someone come up to me and talk to me for uh, just a moment about the person that they were researching that had uh, gone over to Ireland and actually uh, participated with some of the troubles there and then got, got kicked out of the country and came back here. Well, there are issues that may create records that can tell you about that particular person. Events should be labeled, whether they are known, presumed, or unclear. Now, a number of us have family stories. 
and people come to us and they say, absolutely, this is fact, you know, and, you, and then you say, how do I know that? And they say, well, it just is, okay? So I have dealt with those kinds of family stories in my family. <coughs> people were adamant that my third great grandfather, on his death, freed all of his slaves. It was 1812. Um, I didn't believe it. Uh, and sure enough, as I investigated it, no, there's his wife's inventory in 1829, and they are talking about the disposition of each one of them and the amount of money that was collected for their disposition. So, uh, he did not free them. Well, where did the story come from? Over the years, I believe that there was some corrupted story in the family. Uh, a son of his, in his will, stipulated that. Uh, the, the will was written just before the Civil War. He died just after the Civil War. But in his will that he wrote before the Civil War, he was adamant that, at his death, that the families were not to be separated, that, that the, the mothers were not to be separated from their children if they were sold. And so I think somewhere between the two stories, um, Whatever happened as it came down through the family, um, it was attributed to his father, and the story was changed. Well, there are things that I know, there are things that I presume, and there are things that are just flat out unclear. For each event, you have to ask who, what, when, where, and why. You want to know the motivation if you can. Why are people moving from one area to another? I was researching a descendant in Meridian, Mississippi. It said that he was educated in Philadelphia. Where's Philadelphia? Mississippi. 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 Sorry. Yeah. He was going to dentistry school in Philadelphia, Mississippi. What's my first thought? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Right? Okay. Well, as you put those timelines together and you start to look at the events, you suddenly get a different picture. For metaphors, list likenesses and differences between then and now. We'll have a fun little story about that here in a few minutes. But sometimes a phrase or something that someone has said meant something different in that time period than it means today. You've done this with your children or your nieces or nephews. You say something and it's perfectly clear to you and they look at you and just go, that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, it's because they aren't familiar with the metaphor that you are using. If we look at a timeline here, for example, for John Nelson Rancher, we can see what's happening. Notice that I've recorded even when there was no census that he could be found in. So when the census didn't exist for 1790, 1800, and 1810, I have listed that in his timeline because that alerts other researchers that it doesn't it exists and isn't there. Um, I listed an about date for the marriage. Can I can I locate the marriage record? No, but I can I can I can locate evidence of marriage. I locate his wife's. I, I locate his father-in-law who mentions his wife in his will. Well, it's evidence of marriage, but it isn't the marriage date. <coughs> then I list all of the children. And what's going on? Um, I list the 1820 census. There is no census for that <coughs> county, but he's listed on the 1820 county, uh, Wake County tax list. Uh, I list the births of the rest of his children. Uh, in 1844, there was a letter from his brother to his sister describing Nelson as being in poor health and will possibly not see another Christmas. By the 30th of June, 1849, he's not listed in the 1850 U.S. Census mortality <coughs> deaths that would have occurred then. And his wife Elizabeth is listed in the 1850 census, age 60, living with their eldest son, James Hinton. Well, all I have now is this window of time uh, that tells me that he probably died there. There's a little more in the letter that I probably can share with you. Daniel is lamenting to his sister that Nelson has been to Mobile, where he picked up five barrels of whiskey. And Daniel comments that Unless his habits change, he'll probably not last long. <laughs> All right, so defining the research effort, defining what your outcome is. When you define what the desired outcome is, then you have a better chance of hitting the target. 
So like I say, at home, it's not the project that is difficult for me. It's the change requests from my wife as we go through the project that create the challenges. So, there's the history of the common ancestor as a foundation piece. So you may say that you want to create a history of that, of that person. You may want to do three generations of all descendants for that person. You may want to do five generations of descendants, or ten generations, or all the descendants of any surname. So, for example, I can go in and I can write a descendancy only for those who have the rancher surname, but not worry about the families of the daughters and who they marry. So that so that what it turns into is a specific rancher genealogy on only the ranchers. Or I can go in and I can do all the descendants in that family. You have to decide how big that box is going to be when you draw it. You can do all the descendants of the same surname. So, when we do those, volume one, the descendants of Reverend James Fitch, volume two, which were generations six and seven, and the descendants of the Reverend James Fitch, volume three, generations eight through ten. So this author decided that he would work at it at tiers. So he completed uh, the first five generations, and then he picked up and did generations six and seven, and published it, and then he picked up and did generations eight through ten. You can see how he focused his work on what he was wanted to accomplish and what he did. He started with the biography of the common ancestry. Then he went back He did the English ancestry of that person. So he did a lot of work across the pond. And then he started with the descendants. But you can see how he very clearly carved up what he wanted to do. In some instances, you may want to do a genetic uh, pedigree or medical history. Sometimes these are, can be a little convoluted. Uh, this one happens to be mine. You can see that there are multiple marriages, multiple spouses. You can see that the, the genetic um, causes of death, as they are listed on death certificates, are there. Now, why is this important to me? Important to me because I'm adopted. And so I had to work very hard to come up with what my genetic history was. Uh, imagine the look on my doctor's face when I walk in and handed it to him. He goes, well, I've never had one of these. <laughs> I said, no, but now you know what to look for. All right, do we simply reverse the process? Where did an ancestor come from versus where did his descendants go? It's not the same. And so you don't just simply change your research methodology that way. Tracing historical migration trails to the point of entry. So tracing it back, where did they come into? Well, if, you're, if your ancestors are in this area, uh, there's a good chance they came into the port of Philadelphia, right? Makes sense. Um, but looking for evidence of social, cultural, and economic drivers. So when we look at immigration or migration, everyone was either pulled to a particular place or they were pushed to a particular place. So let's say that um, we are dealing with trying to find descendants who decided to move as a result as a result of the influenza epidemic in the early 20th century. They may have felt pushed out of a community for health reasons. They may have said, that's it, we're getting out of here. I don't want any of my family, family members dying of this. And the air is good in Arizona. We're, go we're going to Arizona. Okay? Um, the other thing might be that someone pulled them. Someone's in California and says, there are great jobs here. They're writing back and they're saying, you've got to come. I can get you land. I can get you all these things. And so they literally pulled them to California. What's going on in your family uh, member's life that's doing that? So, one of the things that we always want to ask is where does the trail lead and where does it lead <clears throat> in records and other family memorabilia? When you're tracing descendants, so many things depend on the family memorabilia. Where did the family Bible end up? Where are the artifacts? Where are the things that tell the story? So, who generally gets the genealogical family memorabilia? The oldest daughter is more likely to have one of the kind items. Church removal certificates, ancestral overseas letters, those kinds of things tend to go to the oldest daughter. In great silver, uh, she may get her pick of the best photographs first. Uh, artifacts like communion tokens. <clears throat> This is an example of community tokens that were issued in Ireland. 
Now years ago, I liked to go, I liked to go through a little jar of stuff that my mother kept in her dresser. There were all kinds of interesting things in there. And I'd have the jar open, and I'm looking at stuff, and she'd walk by, and she'd look down to see what I'm looking at, and she'd say, oh, those are buttons off of your great-great-grandmother's blouse that she wore across the plains as she walked. I'm going, oh, how am I supposed to know that? Okay, so they're in this little glass jar. Well, honestly, you may have, these are little pewter tokens, you may have a little pewter token in something like that, in a jar somewhere in your grandmother's or great-grandmother's house, and it may now be in yours, notice that it just has little initials on it? Well, those can be identified or used to identify where in Ireland your family came from. And so the whole immigration problem that you're working on, the solution may be there, and it may be in the homes of one of the descendants as you trace the descendants. This is a hair wreath, or a diagram of the hair wreath. Notice that it lists numbers, and it lists names down at the bottom. So all of the numbers of the curls that are made in the hair wreath, everybody knows what a hair wreath is. They would take locks of hair of family members, and they would create a wreath out of it. I have a complete family group here. As I look at the people that are at the bottom and uh, identified in the family wreath, well, that uh, gives me uh, a good idea of who the descendants were in that family. Now, who generally gets the father's keepsakes? The oldest, the youngest, or only sons are more likely to have military medals, tools, uniforms, uh, that type of thing. And we never know. But when you are coming up with a research strategy and you're trying to find family memorabilia or family Bibles, I always start with tracing the descendants of the oldest daughter and the oldest, the youngest, or only sons in those families, because those are the people that I want to check first. Those are the descendants that I want to make contact with initially, if I can, to see if I can identify that. Uh, this was a little pistol that my um, great grandfather had, an 1878, a little 32 caliber pistol. Uh, I have it uh, in my possession. I'm not carrying it, just so you know. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not fireable, as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fire it. So, the youngest or the only son may have that. Now, creating a network, who knows that you're working on a descendancy? You want people to know that you're doing that. Why? Because they may come across items that relate to the research that you're doing. So you want people to know that you're working on those. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was the director of the Family History Library, I met with the director of the DAR Library. We conducted business throughout the day. Uh, the day ended. Um, his wife was working at a local public library. Uh, she was a librarian there. And so we went to dinner. And uh, about 8 o'clock, I dropped him off at his home, and his wife had just finished her shift and was just arriving. I met her briefly. Um, she, she heard who I was, and uh, so interestingly enough, um, that was in September. The day after Thanksgiving, I got a hastily scribbled note from the director of the EAR library, which said, my wife was going through a box of gift books the other day and came across this family Bible that had been dropped off at the library. She noticed that it has the surname Rancher in it. It's probably not yours, but we thought you might be interested. Was I interested? Absolutely. I knew exactly whose uh, Bible it was. So, she worked there at the Fairfax County Library. Now, think about all of the public libraries in this country where that box of gift books could have been dropped off. It's dropped off at the one library where the person whose job it is to go through the gift books knows me. All right? So there in the little family Bible is the information that I have been seeking. I had the little picture that you see on the right here of the two girls. I had that picture from the family letters I told you about earlier that were down in Chapel Hill and in Durham. I could see from the age of those two girls that I was missing 
information on one of those children. Because in the information I had, I didn't have two girls that were that close in age together. And yet I knew that those were his daughters. And so sure enough, here in the family Bible is this, Andrew, let me see if I've uh, transcribed it for you. This is Mary Louisa Rancher. Uh, departed this life in the city of Washington on the 14th day of February, 1849. Now, why are they in Washington? They're in Washington because Abraham Rancher is a five-term congressman from the state of North Carolina. So he and his family have gone to Washington. <clears throat> she dies on the 14th day of February, 1849, at 11 o'clock in the morning, and was buried in the Washington Cemetery, number 126, in Range M East. Quote, she was taken of scarlet fever February 8th, and at 11 o'clock on the 14th, her spirit passed away. The beautiful clay was carefully ornamented by the hands of a stranger. Sweet, lovely child, farewell. It's written by her mother. Well, my next trip to Washington, D.C., the cab driver and I got out of the cab and scurried around the cemetery and found her gravestone. The entire rest of the family are all buried down in North Carolina, where Abraham was from, but I could never find this dog. Okay. So think back through that. The only way I found this information was somebody knew that I was tracing uh, the ranchers and tracing the, the descendants. So, where does that trail lead? What does marriage and divorce do to tracing female lines? <clears throat> How many times can that surname change? Seven. Those name changes create issues. What happens when the name changes are compounded by multiple locality changes? How do you know where they're going? Where are the records located for those areas? Contact with relatives oftentimes is the only way that you can sort out that story when you are tracing descendants. So contact with living relatives is extremely important in descendant research. The loss of the scattering of the family memorability with every generation, you continue to have that material divided up amongst the living descendants. Now the living descendants are moving all over the place. I have evidence of a glass etching of the only grandchild that was living at the time that my third great grandfather died in 1812. It was of his granddaughter, it was a glass etching of his granddaughter. At this point, I've traced it as far as Florida, and I believe that one of the descendants who are living in Florida has that glass etching but I'm still on the trail, still on the hunt, to try and track that down. There are just a number of other things where those um, trail may lead you to record sets and people that will answer that. When searching for the marriage of a female daughter or a divorced mother, obviously we have to look under her birth name because that's the name that she was born with. We may want to look under her mother's maiden name because after a divorce, the mother may have taken back her maiden name and she may have changed their, the child's name back to her maiden name. We also have to look at the surname of any of her mother's subsequent husbands. So you can see that there are a number of different varieties there. So let's look at some strategies for records commonly used in tracing the sentence. Strategies for funeral home records. Uh, these can be extremely useful, particularly if the public death records are closed. Uh, it all depends, I will tell you, on <clears throat> how the people at that particular funeral home choose to handle information that they share or don't share. I worked at a home, uh, funeral home for seven years. Uh, we had a file on every case that we had done. In that file went everything. So when we did a first call and we went out to the hospital and actually picked up the body, the notes that I scribbled down, I guarantee you are still in those files uh, in Arizona, the notes that I scribbled down about the deceased and took back with me, from which was the beginning of the death certificate, um, those are the notes, those notes are in the file. The funeral card is in the file, the obituary is in the file. All of that kind of information is in there. If there's a burial certificate or a removal certificate, we shipped the body somewhere to another location to be buried somewhere else, those records are in that file. So, you want to ask for copies of the death certificates if they will give them to you copies of the obituary, copies of the funeral card or the program, all of those things, information on burial or cremation. Uh, in some instances there isn't, for example, a tombstone. Why? Because they chose to cremate the person. Uh, billing information for the next of kin. 
Remember, I was telling you earlier I was looking for a half sibling. Well, um, I knew that the half sibling's mother had died. I had uh, a little photo that uh, I could chase uh, for them. And this contact information for the next of kin became extremely uh, important. When we, when I went looking, for them, and I contacted the funeral home, and I and I said, you know, I'm looking for uh, this person. They said, actually, there are two daughters uh, of this person. Well, the other daughter would have been another half sibling of mine that I did not know about. And so I said, oh, there, there are two daughters. And, and she very graciously said, yes, there's one that lived in Illinois and one that lived in Pennsylvania. Well, I've been looking for the death certificate for my father's first wife, and I couldn't find it in Pennsylvania. Sure enough, the mother had died at the home of her daughter in Illinois. The death certificate was in Illinois. There was a burial certificate of removal back to Pennsylvania to her home location where she was buried. Missing death certificates. Uh, the Bible Record Division doesn't have a copy of the death certificate. They possibly died in another state, as I have just explained to you. That's a very uh, appropriate uh, possibility. The removal permit was filed with the local funeral home. And you may get a copy of that. You may want to contact the funeral homes in the area where the lump sum death benefit was paid in Social Security. So, for example, in this instance of my father's first wife, the lump sum death benefit was paid to the daughter with whom she was living in Illinois. So that was my first clue that she died in, may have died in Illinois, not in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is um, the picture. Uh, of my two half sisters. Um, years ago, my uh, other half sister came to my wedding reception and she gave me this picture and she said that the um, oldest girl in this picture is my sister, uh, Linda. And I said, Who's the little girl sitting on your lap? And she said, I don't know, it must be a neighbor girl. Well, it turned out that that was Elaine and that was um, the person that was, that, that was the person where. Um, where my uh, father's first wife, these were the two children uh, that they had by them. I had never met either of them. Um, when I got the information from the funeral home, I picked up the phone and I actually got the phone number for Elaine, not for Linda. I, on my phone, I was looking for Linda and then suddenly uh, discovered Elaine. So I called Elaine and Elaine answered the phone. and. Uh, she said, just a minute, she says, I'm outside my house and I'm locked out. I'm going to have to crawl through the garage window and back into the house. And so I'm on the phone while she crawls back into the house. And so I kind of start this conversation, okay? So here's a cold call with a half-sibling that you've never met, I've never talked to. And I said, you know, it's kind of, I don't think this is a bad thing, but you know, I'm, I think I'm your half-brother. And she stopped at that point and she says, oh my gosh, I know you. She knew about me, but I didn't know about her. And so um, it was interesting over the years, uh, they had plenty of information to fill in the blanks for me because my family had left Pennsylvania. I was actually born here, but before I was a year old, my family picked up and moved to Arizona, and so I was raised in Arizona. So you never know from a particular family photograph, um, you, may, you may get a story. Strategies for cemetery records. Uh, the name and address of a plot owner is extremely important because that tells you how many plots were purchased. So that's one of the things that I've been working with the guys at Billy Graves on, and they have been coming up with that data. Because if you know how many graves belong to it, then you can search the graves surrounding to see um, if they are related family members. It overcomes unlisted phone numbers. So oftentimes the name and address of the plot owner, they have contact information. Why? Because in some instances they are still in contact with the people in things related to the people who are interred there. Um, we're getting to a point where most uh, phone listings are 50% unlisted. Why? Because they're all cell phones or more. And a lot of people don't have landlines. I still have a landline. Um, but uh, it, we, we've had it for a long time because um, we keep it, it's such an easy number to remember and, and we use it all the time. So one of the things that I make sure that I keep on my on, on my mobile phone 
is uh, this app called Vintage Phone, so that I can dial a number and you can still have a rotary dial. And it's, I'm just saying. I can actually call you doing that. Um, this strategy identifies the number of graves uh, purchased. Record the number of graves in each uh, direction if there's no sexton record. So when you visit those cemeteries, take down those other graves because you don't know how they're related. Um, I was uh, recently doing some research down in Kentucky uh, with a friend. He has an unusual given name. His given name is Edgy, E-D-G-I-E. -E. And so we were researching his family. Uh, he has an unusual surname. Um, surname is Donaghy, and so here were all the Donaghy graves, and next to the Donaghy graves was an edgy tailor, and uh, it's pretty clear that, you know, he was named, or his grandfather actually was named after this person, we just don't know how he's related, so obviously we captured uh, that information as well. Strategies for family papers for finding notes. Um, a number of universities will go after the papers of um, alumni, uh, prominent alumni in particular, uh, but they will deposit those records at the manuscript libraries for uh, universities. Uh, check related lines and married spouses. Did, did a spouse marry someone who was important? These family papers that I have from North Carolina are in those manuscript libraries because the daughter married someone who then became prominent. Not that, not that the fellow that I was tracing, Daniel, wasn't that prominent. He was, he was well off, but he wasn't, he wasn't in politics. He wasn't, you know, wasn't anything spectacular that way. But what happened was his history is preserved because his sister married someone who was prominent. Those university manuscript collections then have much of that genealogically related data. Much of that you can find through archive grid uh, and, the, and the details there. Geological and historical societies also have many of these family papers as you continue to look at those collections. You heard Paige a few moments ago tell you how many papers are deposited here. I've been down in the, in the stacks uh, of, their, <clears throat> of their material behind the scenes here, and it is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal collection of what is here. This, for example, is the uh, guide of the catalog records at Duke University in their manuscript library. Uh, here's a reference then to the Rufus Henry Jones papers. The papers of Rufus Henry Jones include items pertaining to his grandfather and uncles and material on the Rancher and Merrick families of North Carolina. Um, so that, that was my access point, uh, finding those materials. It was interesting that in a little notebook, um, Rufus Jones, Henry Jones's grandfather had recorded all of the births, marriages, and deaths of the Jones family in that little notebook. It was like a family Bible, but it wasn't a family Bible. It was just a notebook that you would have picked up at the dime store, that kind of thing. And so there were uh, the materials that were extremely important to me. Uh, family letters. Uh, this is an 1899 uh, family letter between two cousins who did not know about each other. So um, I have one cousin writing to the other one and asking, because Rancher is such an unusual name, saying you must be related, um, you know, how are you related, and, and what are the details of your family. He writes back in 1899 and starts detailing all of the information on his family. He talks about who his sister married, talks about the birth and death of his children. When I am done and I have abstracted that letter, I have 66 different items of family history in that one letter talking about details of births, marriages, deaths, uh, where they went, where they lived, where they settled. Um, all of that type of information from that family letter, simply because the, the cousin made a query. Now think about that in the context of today. We still do that. How do we do it? We do it via email. I, I honestly believe tell you this standing here, I believe that in the future, the most difficult generation to trace in, in family history is going to be our generation, because everything is disposable. And I fear that this kind of information is not going to be preserved. And so, think about that in terms of what you're recording. Here was a plat map of the property 
in those family papers. So I knew exactly where his property was. I could go stand them, you know. Everybody wants to scoop up a jar of dirt to take it home and stick it on the mantle and say that came from the old family property in North Carolina, right? Um, where does the trail lead? Well, here was a graduating uh, program for the Greensboro Female College. So the names aren't the names of the graduates aren't on there, but this thing meant something to this family. So where does the trail lead me? It leads me to look for who graduated from the college and how are they related. Uh, these family uh, letters here again. Um, dear uncle, sad indeed it is for me uh, uh, to write to you of our deep affliction. Uh, our dear father has been taken from us by that monster death. So here's the, the letter writing to other family members talking about his death in 1868. Um, I talked earlier about um, the genealogical reports in York County, Pennsylvania. This was the genealogical report for the Overlander family that I was working on. Um, the family had not been put back into the context of families, but the material had been abstracted. So in other words, the heavy spade work that we have to do to, to, to gather the data, that had already been done. So when I opened it, now I am analyzing and putting the data together, and these are the uh, graveyards and, and what's coming together. Telephone directories can still give you uh, some of that information and where they live and what's uh, available. And I know it's difficult for some people. I'm not, I'm not shy. I can pick up the phone and make a cold call and try not to sound like a salesman or political survey or whatever it is these days. Sorry. Because I have to answer the phone three times a night for some survey they want me to answer. But the phone book may be the answer. Um, here is uh, evidence of a family Bible. Uh, this was for the Copeland family um, Bible out in the Lancaster Historical Society. And I can see a little note on this that it says this is the family Bible of James Copeland of Manor Township, Lancaster County, now owned by the Landis Valley Museum. Uh, it gives you the date of the Bible. So where do you think I went next? I went to the Landis Canyon Museum to see the Bible. Long story short, they very sheepishly came back and said, you know, several years ago, we sold all those off. Did you keep a record of who bought them? No. We have no idea. So, somewhere is still the James Copeland Bible. I'm going to have to rely on the transcript and hope that they transcribe it. Uh, the newspaper clipping file, where they're taking all of the obituaries and putting those in. Obituaries are a key item in tracing descendants because they start to talk about, they name the children, who they marry, and where they are located. Obituaries are a, are a huge resource. Family Search has been indexing online numerous obituaries. A lot of the material that we are indexing and put up online is coming from obituaries. We've got like 400 million obituaries to index. And so a lot of our <coughs> indexing is going on in indexing obituaries, which will help you in tracing the sentence. So continue to search. Remember I said one and a half million names per day? Many of those are coming from obituaries that we are indexing. Uh, compiled genealogies. This is the bibliography of Pennsylvania genealogies and family histories. Um, you want to look at compiled works. Someone may have already worked on a family or worked on a family that ties into your family. So every time you change your focus, you need to do this survey phase, which will say, okay, has anyone else compiled the data on this family? Because if they have, when that surname changes, and you need to do that survey phase to see if someone else has already done the work. And I will tell you, you absolutely must, yes you must, keep a record of what you've done as a research counselor. Because if you don't, Here's what will go through your head. You will pick up a document and you will say, I've seen this before. All the time, right? Okay, what that means is you didn't consult your research calendar, you didn't come back to, you, you, you aren't looking at new stuff, you continue to look at the same stuff um, that you've already done. So, the principal record sources for the 19th and the 20th century for tracing descendants. Newspaper obituaries, 
Many of these are on microfilm, but they are being uh, automated and going online. Family papers, wherever they are. So manuscript libraries in the homes of uh, particular families. Uh, I was visiting a, a, a couple who now own an old family farm in North Carolina. I had, they had reached out to us on the internet because of a tombstone of my great-great-grandmother that was on their property. And so I was visiting and I was taken out to the tombstone. We were sitting there chatting. I had probably been there for an hour. And um, finally the wife says to me, we have all of the deeds for this property. Would you like to see them? <laughs> yeah, I'd really like to see all those deeds. And so she comes walking out of the bedroom, holding a stack, no less than this high, of all of the deeds of that property as it had transitioned down through the generations. Okay, so I'm opening them up and photographing those deeds because they've got them. So sometimes the family papers that you want are still in their possession. Cemetery records, make sure that you have coverage and make sure that you have saturation as to the names that are immediately around there or other names in them. Plot people with the same name in the cemetery. How close are they related? Are they in the same section? Particularly when you're dealing with common names. Uh, look at the administration papers. Honestly, I always love it when there's an administration file versus a will. Will be great, but so often there's more information in an administration file than there is in a will. Uh, I love those. Um, we talk, I talked in the last session about Pazilla. Uh, so computer-assisted programs can actually take and help you identify where the holes are in those uh, programs. So when you go on and you look at your line, you can actually begin to see and trace the descendants. Every one of these are uh, pairs of uh, descendants on John Greg Rancher. So you can see that we have done a pretty good job within the first few generations of identifying uh, all of his generations, but then when you go further down, what do you start to see? You start to see holes. Well, those are opportunities as you're tracing the descendancy. Those are the areas that now need further research in tracing the descendants. And so Pozella is this great visual tool to try, to try and help you identify where there may be missing information or where descendants have not been traced yet for those individuals. Um, Search the Family History Library catalog. Uh, we talked about OCLC uh, and, and Archive Grid. Uh, so when you go on Family Search and you go into the catalog, uh, you want to search that by searching on a WorldCat and or Archive Grid. When you search those, you can find those archives near you and ones that may have uh, a location for you uh, about with records about your family. So what is Archive Grid? Uh, you, can, you can get more information about them. Uh, they do keep a blog. Uh, Archive Grid includes over 3 million records describing archival materials uh, and brings all of that historical documentation to you. So it is another access point for you to try and gather that data. So you can see that you can search. Uh, they have an FAQ section that will help you there. Uh, this is an example uh, at UMass at Dartmouth um, going in. It will give you information about the collection and how to plan a visit. When they're open, directions and parking, which many of these are on university campuses, please read the information on parking, or you are going to be walking from one side of campus to the other, I guarantee it. Um, you can just see all of the different types of things that you can do. Discover locations uh, near where you live. You can do that search map, and all the pin dots will come up and you will see what's uh, going on there. So, great information and collections in OCLC. This um, point right here is where FamilySearch became a member of Archive Grid. Can you see the dramatic growth as we begin to add, begin to add our collection to that? FamilySearch loaded their, our information into the OCLC catalog, and that was the growth that took place in Archive Grid. So, weekly visits uh, are up. Unique visitors, we track all of that through our session. You can see here, Family Search becomes a member at that point, and then you can see when we loaded our stuff into 
uh, the, the OCLC catalog, and you can see that the unique visitors went up. Um, we talked about this. This is where the primary collections are from, but you can see that if you're, if you, if you're researching the areas, you can see you can see Italy there, for example. You can see Germany. You can see France. Uh, you can see South Africa, Australia, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, you can see that there are collections from all over the world in that. So hovering over each of those countries in blue will reveal the number of collections in that area. So, for example, here. Um, you can see that uh, there are 615,000 collections over a particular state, um, and as you look at that, it tells you what data you have there. Uh, how to search archives grid? You can go in and you can and you can search by uh, you can narrow your search using quotes. You can do something not uh, so this not this, uh, and use all of the search strategies that you normally do. So that partnership. Gives us worldwide access to that. It gives the locations for every family history center throughout the world. It gives us the ability uh, to identify the bulk of the major genealogical collections. So, collections such as the one here uh, gives us the ability to identify those. So, first and foremost, establish your desired outcome. Make sure that you are clear on what it is you want to want to do, and then set your research expectations around the reality of your frame. Um, I travel a lot. Um, when I do research in England, for example, a really good research day in England is about six hours. And that's if everything goes absolutely beautiful. Uh, a good research day here in the US can be anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 hours, depending on who's open and how I can navigate to other uh, entities. So think now about the expense of traveling overseas. And you're, and you're getting this this tiny little time frame of uh, research hours. You want to you want to maximize that. So set your expectations. I had a good friend who was working on his wife's land. He was convinced that these people were in this parish in London. He got to England, went to the London parish, opened up the parish registers. They weren't there. He didn't have a backup plan. He said he didn't know what to do next because he was so certain that they were going to be there. That he, that he just didn't know what to do. So have contingency plans for what you do. Make sure that those contingencies have strategies around them. So what if I don't find the people I'm, I expect to find in that record? Two things have to go through your mind then. Not only, now where do I go look, but try and answer, why didn't I find them where I expected to find them? There has to be a reason why they were not there. Because if you fully expect for them to be in this record in this locality at this time period, something has happened for why they are not there. Lastly, have fun. Tracing the sentence is a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of living co uh, cousins. Um, I don't know if any of you, uh, and I don't know if the program is even available out here, but uh, BYU TV in Provo, Utah has started a reality show now called Relative Race. And they are identifying the cousins ahead of time and they give the people so long to get from point A to point B. They've got four couples that are competing against each other, and they get to town, and they have, then they have to do a task, and then they get to meet their relative, and then they spend the night with the relative, and the next morning that relative then gives them their instructions for going the next, the next leg of their trip. So they're working their way across the country. Uh, with the latest, uh, latest episode, they've made it into New Mexico and Colorado. So. They're going to work their way east, and who knows who they'll find. But uh, if they don't get there in time, they get a strike against them, and three strikes, and you're out. So they're competing. So it's just kind of fun. There are things that can that you can do with uh, meeting these relatives and, and doing that. And so I I hope that it's fun to you. I hope that you enjoy uh, the research, the descended research. It is a bit different than ancestral research, and I hope that I give you some tips today that will help. Thank you. Thank you.